Well, this is Senator James Langford from Oklahoma, and you're joining us another episode of The Breakdown. It is an opportunity to be able to take some of the complicated issues of the day, try to break them down, and to spend a little more time making you the smartest kid at the water cooler, even if you're safely socially distanced at the water cooler uh, in your conversation. Uh, this is a podcast that we do that we talk about all kinds of issues that are both foreign policy, domestic. Today is a foreign policy conversation, and we're going to spend it with one of the smartest people that I know, period, but definitely one of the smartest people I know on foreign policy, that is former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Uh, Mike Pompeo, many people know him as the former Secretary of State, may also know him as the former director of the CIA, may also know him as the former congressman from the 4th District of Kansas, may also know him as the former business owner in Kansas doing aerospace and manufacturing, may also know him as the former first in his class at West Point or graduate of the Harvard Law School. But really who he is, is Susan's husband, and uh, that's that's his best moment. He's also uh, the dad of Nick. And uh, Mike, it is great to be able to have you here today to be able to join us uh, in this podcast. Uh, this podcast is available on Spotify and iTunes and all those places. Lots of folks subscribe to it to be able to pick it up. Uh, they pick it up because they know we bring them the most current information on some of the hardest issues. And you definitely have some of the hardest issues today. And that's dealing with issues of foreign policy. So thanks for the work that you have done uh, to be able to help the nation and for what you've done literally for people all over the world that never know how to be able to say thank you to you. Uh, but thanks for that engagement. Bless you. Thank you, James. I'm looking forward to our conversation. I know you and Cindy are great leaders there in Oklahoma. Bless you for the work you're doing as well. And I hope we can get everybody who's listening to us today a little bit deeper understanding of some of the things that uh, around the world that actually impact their lives each and every day. You know, it is amazing when you're in the United States, sometimes we get focused on the issues in the United States and think, why should we care about things around the world? And then things happen like they do in Afghanistan, where 20 years ago, a group of people that most people had never even heard of from Al Qaeda with a guy named Osama bin Laden uh, under the auspices of the Taliban who allowed them to be able to thrive, planned an attack and killed almost 3,000 Americans in a day. And suddenly the country 20 years ago said, we should pay attention to Islamic extremism in the Middle East that we have ignored for a while. Now, 20 years later, uh, we watched the debacle of the withdrawal uh, that happened with the Biden administration and leaving out from Afghanistan. Our hearts grieved for American lives that were lost and Afghan lives that were lost in that withdrawal. And a lot of people around my state asked me a simple question. Would this have been different if the Trump administration had done the withdrawal? Because there was a lot of conversation to say, well, the Trump administration was going to leave. The Biden administration was going to leave. This was inevitable. This had to happen that way. I've talked to you before and you've told me it wasn't inevitable. There was a very different way that this could have been done. How could have the withdrawal happened from Afghanistan? Because everyone wanted us to get out of Afghanistan. Uh, we knew we weren't going to be there forever in the same kind of footprint. The footprint was going to change. But how could that withdrawal have been different? And what's the now what of the situation that we're in in Afghanistan? James, those are two incredibly important questions. Uh, let me start by uh, once again, issuing my condolences to those who uh, were family members of the 13 who were killed during the American withdrawal. It was a, 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 an unbelievable tragedy. For the larger picture, it, it didn't have to be this way. The execution of reducing risk to these young men and women who've been fighting for 20 years on behalf of the United States in this difficult place it didn't have to transpire this way. We, we, we were certainly trying to get every one of our uniformed military personnel out of that place. President Trump was clear from 2015 and 16 when he was campaigning that he wanted to achieve that. And so those of us tasked with executing that on his behalf uh, were diligently working on it. We got from about 15,000 down to just under 3,000 uh, American uniformed military personnel there. But James, it was we handled it differently. We had uh, three central overriding thoughts. First is uh, we have to make sure that we continue to reduce the risk that we're ever attacked from this place again. Second, as as we as we begin to wind our presence down, but we got we got over 80 percent of our forces out that were there when we showed up. As we as we wound them down, we had to maintain deterrence. We had to continue to do the work to make sure we could get our civilians out, our equipment out, and then ultimately our military personnel in a way that was orderly and didn't create risk. Uh, and then finally, uh, there was this mission to ensure that we could see still what was going on in that place in a way that we could perform the counterterrorism function on behalf of the United States. It required a conditions-based approach. We, we couldn't set an arbitrary deadline. 
Uh, and that's, in the end, what transpired. When the Biden administration talks about not having a plan presented to them, A, it's always your role as commander in chief to have a plan. You don't get to turn to the guy before you. Uh, but second, um, we did have an understanding, a plan on how to move forward. And they tore it up. They set an arbitrary date. They hurried to the exit. It was originally September 11th, a very politically charged date, in my judgment. And once they capped what the military could do and told the Taliban, we're not going to push back on you, we're not going to impose costs, uh, the Taliban pushed, uh, the Afghan forces withdrew, the Americans didn't respond, and you can see the debacle that ensued. Yeah, one of the big questions is out there is just Bagram Air Force Base and uh, why they were functioning out of a commercial airfield rather than out of Bagram Air Force Base, which was a very secure location. Was that always in the plan just to abandon Bagram Air Force Base and all that equipment that was there? No, the sequence was all out of whack. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and anybody who's, uh, who's done just a basic learning about military history could have seen that the departure of the one true place we could get high volumes of personnel and equipment out, Bagram, not, not the international airport in Kabul, I could see that that was going to be backwards. I, I think what happened, James, to be honest with you, and I don't know this for sure, but I, my sense is, once they told the military leadership uh, that we're not going to do what you want, and I know what the military leadership would have wanted to do because they told us the same thing when we were there, the military leadership would have told them not to close Bagram, would have told them to continue to keep a footprint there and to do this in a certain sequence. They upended that. But once they made the political decision to cap the number of folks, I think the military was stuck and they made the best of what was remaining, and that was to try to use Kabul as the exfiltration point and I'm, I'm sure the military knew that this was really risky and, and fraught with danger, and we saw that uh, they were, in fact, right. It was, actually, very risky and very fraught with danger uh, for a lot of families that were there. Uh, the, the situation now on the ground, obviously, you're not Secretary of State right now, so I'm not going to ask you to try to give classified information because you're not getting classified information anymore. But you can see the news, and you, and you know kind of the trends of where things were going at this point. What are your concerns about Afghanistan for the next couple of years based on how we departed and where we are right now? Well, I, I'm not seeing the current information, but I can tell you two objective facts. The first is, uh, if you listen to the, even the public statements of uh, Islamist fundamentalists, whether that's Al-Qaeda or ISIS or other splinter groups, uh, they believe that America's deterrence model is uh, less effective than it was just a year or two ago. And so they are going to redouble their efforts to continue to build out their capabilities. This will create increased risk to the homeland and to, frankly, to American interests and our partners and friends' interests around the world as well. Uh, so I think that's I think that's inescapable. Second, uh, our, our credibility was damaged, not because we'd made the decision that said we're, we're no longer going to have 15,000 soldiers in Afghanistan. I think all our friends and allies understood that that wasn't an indefinite, sustainable commitment. Uh, but because of the way that we withdrew, because we didn't brief them, because we didn't work alongside them, because it was so chaotic, our credibility was damaged. And from General Secretary Xi Jinping to Chairman Kim to the Ayatollah in Iran, I am confident that they now feel like the American leadership has a credibility gap. And I'm very concerned that they'll take action to try and press on that in ways that will redound to their benefit and uh, to our cost here in the United States. Yeah, let, let, let me drill down on that a little bit, uh, because that becomes a really big issue in areas like Israel. And you spend a lot of time uh, working on uh, policy and uh, peace in the Middle East and Israel. And you did it a pretty crazy way, quite frankly, uh, because the typical model is you're trying to be able to develop peace among Palestinians and Israelis, and then you work on everybody else after the fact on it. You took the whole thing, and President Trump took the whole thing and put it on its head and said, I think there are some people that are around the region that are sick of saying this has to go first. Let's actually work on peace in, with Israel and other countries. And President Trump and your leadership and so many others, Jared Kushner and others, were very engaged in trying to be able to create something called the Abraham Accords. Uh, it was a way to be able to establish peaceful relationships between Israel and other Arab countries in the region, and quite frankly, even outside the region, and to say, what can we do to establish normalized relationships here so we can get economic development, trade development, tourism uh, back and forth, and engagement. But this really radical concept that was in there was also a religious liberty aspect of it that was uh, quite stunning to be able to see Arab nations uh, with Israel saying, we're going to honor religious liberty in our countries. Uh, for Arab countries predominantly, they're not known for religious liberty. Israel is. 
but many of the Arab countries, that's not the first thing they're known for, but they, they formed this agreement saying, this is what we want to do and want to become. That was just a remarkable undertaking uh, to be able to do that. Unfortunately, we've not seen the Biden team continue to be able to advance that. But walk us through a little bit about the Abraham Accords. What are they and what can they mean for the future? Uh, James, it was a pretty radical idea. Your point's well taken. There had been, uh, on a bipartisan basis, a central understanding that not much good could come from peace arrangements in the Middle East until the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians was resolved. Uh, our, our view was, while we wanted to work on that, we hope for a better life for the Palestinian people too, as we do for every human being, because they're, because they're simply made in the image of God. Uh, we weren't going to let that stand in the way of progress. And so we began to build out a set of understandings. Certainly, our, our movement of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, the recognition of the Golan Heights as rightfully belonging to Israel, uh, the decision to saying to our legal posture with respect to Israel's presence in the uh, territories that had been viewed by some in the administrations prior to us as being occupying force, we just upended them. And I think that I think that signaled to Arab countries that they ought to uh, acknowledge Israel's rightful place in the world. Can, so I, can we, I just stop you right there, Mike? Every other president and every other secretary of state before you said, if you do any of those things, there'll be chaos in the streets in right. Israel and the Palestinian areas. Don't take the risk to be able to do any of that. Everyone lived in fear of that until President Trump and you and your leadership said, no, we, we need to do this. It's the right thing to do. It shows strength of America, not weakness of America. You move the embassy to Jerusalem. You recognize the Golan Heights. You recognize all these different housing neighborhoods. They're not settlements. They're neighborhoods uh, that are there in that area around Jerusalem. You recognize all those and it actually does the opposite effect. Now Arab countries actually lean in and say, let's start negotiating. You're a strong leader, let's go. I mean, it, it, again, it was exactly the opposite of what everyone had believed in the it's, past. It's, it's a really good point. And we were briefed the same way, right? The traditional understandings in every think tank in this town and inside the intelligence community and diplomats all said, if you do these things, there'll be chaos or war at worst. Uh, we, we didn't just willy-nilly do it. We tried to lay the groundwork to prevent those very bad outcomes from happening, but it, of course, wasn't riskless. And I give President Trump full credit. President Trump was prepared to say this is the morally right thing to do with respect to Israel and to then execute and deliver on the commitments that he'd made to the American people during his campaign. Uh, and so we built out the central understanding. James, you pointed this out before. They begin with an understanding of religious freedom. If you go read these the accords themselves, right? That's a fancy name for a contract or a, a promise that were made by a series of leaders uh, begins talking about religious freedom in these places. And you now have, a, you will have better lives for the people of the Emirates, for the people in Morocco and Sudan and Bahrain. They'll have more commercial success, they'll have more prosperity, and they'll, they'll live lives that are uh, fuller and more complete. And all it took was for them to say that Israel is the rightful homeland of the Jewish people and that the state deserves to exist uh, and not continue their uh, anti-Zionist policies in the way that they had had in place for decades and decades. I am confident too, James, this is perhaps the last thought. I'm confident that other Arab nations, other Muslim nations will join these accords as well. I hope that the next administration will see that this isn't about politics. And if you need to change the name from the Abraham Accords, because that's too tied to Mike Pompeo and Donald Trump, for goodness sakes, do that. But get it right for these people. It will mean good things for them. It'll increase security for the United States. We'll have to send fewer, fewer of our young men and women to do hard things in that place. If we can get this right and build on this, it will truly upend a place that has been incredibly unstable for decades and create more peace for all of us. Yeah. You, you also engaged in a way in that region that uh, was really different, and that is with Iran. Uh, you and I have talked about this before. Iran is the single biggest destabilizing force in all of the Middle East. Uh, and what they're doing to promote terrorism uh, with Hezbollah, with Hamas, uh, with so many other small terrorist groups that are in the region, uh, what they do to continue to be able to provoke uh, Saudi Arabia, what they've done in Yemen uh, in the civil war there. Obviously, their, uh, their clear intentions on attacking Israel and wiping it off the map. Uh, they've been this constant destabilizing force. While the people of Iran, many of them are freedom-loving, well-educated individuals uh, that are in Iran, they live under the thumb of a regime that has been brutal uh, to not only their own people, uh, but to the entire region. 
you engaged with Iran and President Trump engaged with Iran in a way that was very different than had been done before and applied what was called maximum pressure on them. Talk us through a little bit on that and where things go from here uh, and what you're seeing in Iran and all the nuclear conversations. Yeah, James, I remember when I was a CIA director, I was I would brief the president uh, when I was in Washington. So ne nearly each day he received the intelligence briefing. And we would always uh, remark that most of the challenges we would face from terror around the world emanated from Iran. And so it became very clear early on we were going to take a very different approach than the Obama administration had. And so we put pressure on them. We denied them resources, money, funding. Uh, we didn't send pallets of cash. Uh, we denied others, other countries, the capacity to trade with them in a way that took the regime, this theocratic, kleptocratic, authoritarian regime that has destroyed the lives and killed their own citizens inside of Iran. We, we just put as much pressure on them as we could. Uh, we isolated them. Uh, we built out alliances with the Gulf states and with Israel. Those were, those were uh, pieces of how the Abraham Accords ultimately were built. And in the end, we reduced risk to Israel and we reduce risk to Americans right here as home as well. And I give one last thought. We, we were talking about Afghanistan when we began this podcast. We, we shouldn't forget that the Al Qaeda leadership, the Al Qaeda folks who flew those planes into the Twin Towers and flew a plane into Pennsylvania and our Pentagon, um, those Al Qaeda leaders that conducted those operational campaigns today are inside of Iran. They're not in Afghanistan, they're not in Pakistan, but the Al Qaeda senior operational international coordinators sit inside of the capital of the Islamic Republic of Iran. When I when I see this administration sitting at the table with them in Vienna, it's heartbreaking to think that they are sitting down about to give an enormous amount of money to the very people that are hosting Al Qaeda's most senior leadership. Yeah, pain, painful differences uh, in what we're actually seeing at this point uh, than what we have seen to try to engage with them. Uh, I, I need to flip over. It's actually geographically not far away uh, into a tiny little obscure country called China. Uh, that, that nation of more than a billion people that is the second largest economy in the world, second only to ours, uh, President Xi has determined that they're going to be a world force and that they're going to dominate the world. And this conversation about will communism or will freedom actually be the dominant feature in the human race uh, globally is still an ongoing dialogue. Uh, for those that are older that are watching this podcast or listening to this podcast, will remember the conversations with the USSR and with the United States and will the freedom be there or will communism be there? It seems like somewhat that's gone away, but it hasn't gone away um, because China still has a passion to be able to move their philosophy and their dominance and their preeminence around the world. Uh, there's a lot that's going on, obviously, that you led in your engagement. But if I can look forward to where we are now with China and what China wants to do, and just to have uh, everyone that's listening to this to have an awareness of where China is trying to go, I think that'd be helpful to a lot of people as just we try to get context. So, James, you, you got it right in the comparison to the Soviet Union. I would, would argue that this challenge is even greater because of the enormous economic capacity that the 1.4 billion people have inside of China. And General Secretary Xi Jinping uh, has every intention of using every bit of that economic power to try and undermine the lives that we live here in the United States, to fundamentally change our republic from one that respects human rights and human dignity, from one that has the rule of law and property rights, to one that looks exactly like the Chinese model. He's trying it not only here, but in just about every country around the world. And we need to unite those of us that believe in freedom, who understand liberty, who care about human life, all have a responsibility. So it's not about the United States versus China. It's about totalitarianism versus these central understandings of human dignity and uh, how it is our founders bequeathed us this amazing country. It's, it's that serious. Where will they go compete? Well, we've seen it. They'll steal intellectual property, taking thousands of jobs out of places like Oklahoma, good manufacturing jobs. They will attempt to uh, conduct espionage inside the United States. You'll recall, James, that we closed the consulate, the Chinese consulate in Houston, Texas. They were stealing from our energy industry, from the best medical facilities in the Midwest. They're operating a den of spies. We had to close it down. That espionage effort continues. And then they have an enormous military with a cyber capability and a space capability that are truly uh, top of the line and world class. Uh, we also have a lot of American businesses making a lot of money inside of the Chinese 
uh, territory today. And this is different than the Soviet Union. It makes the problem even more complex. But we all are going to have to redouble our efforts. This isn't this isn't about politics. This isn't Republican or Democrat. This gets strikes at the fundamental core of who we are as Americans and what the West looks like and Xi Jinping's effort to undermine those of us who believe in these most basic and important ideas. Yeah, you know what's, what's funny, Mike, in, in some ways, we as Americans, uh, though we argue with each other, there's no great disagreement with that fact. Uh, Americans always are always picking on each other. We always have from the very beginning of our nation. Uh, we're a nation of people that want to be better, and so we're always pushing each other to be able to be better, and we have very open discourse on that. That's why we're so ex terribly excited and we express the First Amendment rights every single day uh, in our nation. So we push each other in that. But it's amazing to us as a people at the end, we still have respect for each other. Uh, we still try to be able to find ways to be able to solve problems uh, as Americans. And we really feel like, why would we have enemies anywhere? But at the same time, the Taliban hates us. Al Qaeda hates us because they have a completely different worldview where they don't believe women should have education. They don't believe women should have jobs or even be able to drive. Uh, they want to be able to suppress people and have a completely different philosophy. And anyone who has a philosophy different than them, they want to be able to destroy. And so we watched them 20 years ago come attack us just for being free Americans. We understand that in China, they have a completely different philosophy of world domination, of communism, of control. What they've done to the Muslim Uyghurs in there to be able to oppress them as a people group. What they do to the different companies to, uh, to be able to say, you're all owned by the communist government, you're all controlled by us. You can't go any farther than what, you, what we tell you you can go, and you have to turn information over to us. We think as private companies here in America, as we function and compete with each other, it's completely different in a communist model where they see our nation as chaotic. They want absolute control and that's central control and they don't like our freedom. It is hard for us as Americans to understand that there truly are people around the world that don't like us just because we live free, not because we've done anything to them. They just don't like our freedom. I would add to that, James, that uh, while I was a, a member of the Trump administration, a government official, I, I always uh, reminded myself of my views of the world as a Christian. We we know that there is evil, that this is a fallen world, and so it is hard for Americans sometimes to get their head around exactly what you described, but we should remember that not only as a, a geopolitical matter, but our understanding of uh, humanity and God reminds us that there are, there are people there uh, that have nefarious intent and are driven by a set of objectives that are just fundamentally different than the ones we want, which are to be right, to be left alone, to raise our families, to, to do the right thing by our neighbors, the golden rule. There are just people out there that are fundamentally different. And the leadership, not the Chinese people, but the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party is precisely in that bucket. They, they are evil. They have an intent that is uh, very uh, well uh, substantiated by their capability. And they would love nothing more than to do what they frankly told uh, Secretary Blinken in Anchorage they would do to ensure the decline of the United States of America. Hmm. Well, we're going to work to, uh, to assure the continual climb of the United States of America uh, as we have been on a direction for now two and a half centuries to continue to be able to climb and to be able what Ronald Reagan described as this beacon of light, uh, the city on the hill. Uh, that we can continue to show what religious liberty looks like, what freedom looks like, what opportunity looks like, uh, with when we see problems in our own nation, how we correct those issues, and we continually work towards creating a more perfect union. Uh, that's a powerful example for the rest of the world. And I remind people all the time that the reason that there's over a million people just this year that are trying to break into our southern border to get into the United States is because we're the greatest nation in the world. In every country in the world, people want to be able to come to the United States. Uh, we have great immigration laws. If people actually follow those laws, uh, they can become citizens of this great country as we've allowed legal immigration for a long time. But people literally are, are working to be able to illegally cross in this country because it's the greatest nation in the world. Now, that's a whole different conversation for a whole nother day. We could spend an hour just talking about what's happening in Central America and why this is so poorly run uh, in our relationship with Mexico and the cartels and so many things that you're so knowledgeable about. But we are out of time. Uh, but I'd love to be able to continue to pick your brain 
uh, on a lot of these other issues, and we're grateful that you continue to be able to stay engaged. Uh, so, Mike, thanks for your leadership for so many years. Thanks for your continual engagement on things that matter uh, around the world and how you're staying up on all these different issues and how you just freely share these with people so that people can be better informed. Uh, we're all better uh, when we're better informed on the very hard issues, even international issues that seem far away. Uh, they do affect us up close if we don't pay attention. So let me give you a last word and then I'll wrap us up after that. James, you nailed it. Uh, I'm long on America too. All the challenges that we've identified that we've walked through, both the external challenges and the internal challenges, they're all very real. But good Americans, people working hard to pre preserve our fundamental way of life, to, to raise their families, to make their schools good at home. Uh, I, I'm confident that this resilient nation will have another good 200 and 50 years and that uh, the, the work that each of us does in small ways to contribute to that will ultimately lead to our continued being the most exceptional nation in the history of civilization. Senator Langford, thanks for the work that you do to make that happen as well. Mike, thanks very much. I, I have to tell you, I have people all the time that'll catch me and say, America is lost, we're in a terrible emotion. I, I smile at them and say, America's still there. We're still this great nation, but some people do need to wake up and to be able to be engaged. Some people became passive uh, to be able to sit back and say, it's always gonna be this way, we won't have to work. We do have to work and we have to be able to stay engaged. So for those of you that are working to be able to stay informed and to be able to get facts and information, thanks for joining us uh, in the breakdown. We always wanna bring current information to you, practical information to you, to help keep you well informed, to be able to lead well in your community and in your conversations. Because there are a lot of people around us that have questions, those people that stay informed can actually bring answers to the problems and continue to be able to encourage each other. If you wanna be able to subscribe uh, to this podcast, if you're not a normal subscriber, you can do that on all the different podcast platforms to be able to become a subscriber. I'd encourage you to be able to do that. We'll send you out the notification when the next episode comes out about once a month uh, to be able to get you that most current information for some of the conversation that's happening. We'll bring national leaders on board like Mike Pompeo and other leaders that'll be able to sit down and to be able to talk through some of the tough issues that we face, domestic policy and foreign policy and the things that are affecting us right now. So God bless you. Thanks for engaging in the breakdown and stay in contact with our office. You can always follow us on all the social media platforms at Senator Langford. Go to our website, langford.senate.gov. It's got our contact information and our email information there. And people have not been shy to be able to email us. So feel free to be able to join them and to be able to add another question and we'll get you an answer back as soon as we possibly can. God bless you. We'll see you soon on the next breakdown.